Hooray! We are back again and it's just the two of us with you guys today. In this episode, Rachel talks to me, Katie, about listening to babies during labour. But before I get into telling you what it's all about, I want to say that if you really love the show, please consider two things. A donation to help us keep up and running, either on Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee, And remember, that review you leave on your podcast host really, super duper really, makes a difference in who listens in to the cauldron. Thank you for your support. We love having you bubbling away with us. You'll find all the links in the show notes. But now let's get back to me letting your ear holes know what's in this episode. So come on a journey as Rachel walks us through the history of listening to the baby's heart rate during labour, the interesting and, quite frankly, scary history of the inventor of the pinard trumpet. Um, this one I was quite a gawk at. Is that a word? Rachel tells us her underwater pinard story. We discuss pinards and Doppler listening devices. Hashtag bring back the pinard. What is the evidence for fetal heart rate monitoring in labour? the current guidelines on intermittent auscultation, and the one piece of evidence a lot of guidelines are based off. Also, the normal and expected changes in a full-term healthy baby's heart rate during labour. Rachel gives tips on how to navigate working in the hospital environment with consented or declined auscultations. Katie looks for sponsorship from Kendall Mint Cake. You'll have to listen to know what we're on about with this one. And last, but by no means least, CTG monitoring and what the research says about outcomes for women and infants. So grab your cuppa, stick your keys in the ignition, don't do both at once, and get ready for the show. I'm Katie James and this is the Midwives Cauldron Podcast. Each episode, I'm joined by my incredible co-host, Dr. Rachel Reed. Listen in as we hubble, bubble, toil and trouble our way through aspects of womanhood, midwifery, birth and lactation. So go on, subscribe now and hear us on your favourite podcast host. Good morning, Rachel. Good evening. Morning. Good morning. Um, uh, we're back. We're in season four, and um, we've been yeah, talking but this to isn't going to be today. the first one, so you, so you don't need to do all that. Do you? you can do that for the next one. Well, it might be the first one. Depends which one's more funny. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll just have to start them both with the welcome to the new season. I didn't. I said we're in oh, season four. Oh, okay, well, I've just buggered it up for you now, haven't I? So you could have got away with that. Jesus Christ. I was like, we're in it. We could have just Here been in the thick of it. And I'm just waking up and in the thick of it. Right. They don't have to know that we're recording two in one go. But, you know. Right. Rachel, you're <laughs> going to be talking today. And we are talking to Dr. Rachel Reed about... Listening to the baby during labour. This is my Richard At. No, it's not. It's David Attenborough. <laughs> Was it good? I'm vying for the job next. I think there is a Richard Attenborough. There is his brother, but different. he passed away, I believe. Did he do animal things? No, he was a director. He directed quite a lot of films, probably stuff you've seen. Mm. Right, moving on. Into the forest with Rachel Reed, who's going to tell us about. Don't look at me like that. (laughs) All right, why are we talking about this topic? Well, we're talking about this topic because I'm being lazy. (laughs) 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 I've just, um, I've just recorded a lesson for my learning library in the collective that was all about fetal distress and all of that business and what happens when babies get distressed and listening to them 
and picking it up. Um, so I, when I did that, I updated my blog post. So I'll give you the link to, to this because I won't mm-hmm. remember the research. I'll just right. be like saying the research says blah and I'll re- not remember who it is, but it's in, in the blog it's in post. The blog. <laughs> so, it's have in a look. Show notes. so if you want references, check out the blog post because I've updated it. So that's why I'm doing this because it's all still in my head. Well, Brilliant. I shouldn't say that because then I'm going to look bad if it's not. It's fairly recent in my head. All right. I let you off. So if I'm thinking about this, when did we actually start monitoring babies? Because I mean, we've got like CTGs and we have the pinards that we're listening to. Um, when did we start using those? Did we always listen to babies? Is there a history behind this? Well, so part of the problem is that most of the traditional midwifery was carried out in the collective culture of women who passed practices down through apprenticeship and through word of mouth and through experience so they wouldn't have captured a lot of the practices that were common so we don't know if midwives listened to babies kind of pre-medicine or modern medicine they probably did I would think that it wouldn't you know take a genius to work out that if you put your ear against a woman's abdomen you can hear a baby's Mm. heart rate if you needed to work out if the baby's alive So we don't know, but we do know that when they first started listening with instruments, it was about identifying if babies were dead or alive. So it would be a complicated labor that had been going on for days. And in order to think about what intervention to do, because the interventions were pretty brutal and the baby wouldn't survive them, if they were alive, they'd want to make sure that the baby wasn't alive before they did the interventions. So that was kind of how it started out. And interestingly the instrument you know the pinard yeah guess who invented the pinard um mr pinard yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was a good guess huh <laughs> indeed so it was adolphe pinard who was a french obstetrician and gets worse not that it's bad to be an obstetrician a founder member of the french eugenics society oh so you can have a little guess about what the kind of underlying paradigm, I guess, around listening to babies' heartbeats and labour. Theories. What years? When mm. was this? That was in the late 1800s, the, oh. the, pin, the pinard, as we call it, the pinard, the trumpet. There were, were other listening devices, but that's the kind of one that's carried through. And, you know, midwives, it's really interesting, isn't it? The midwives often have the pinard as their kind of... Not talisman, but yeah, we but like, like our. Mascot. I've got some. I've got lovely pinards. We yeah, like our pinards. Ones. I've got nice wooden ones that are pretty useless in practice. The metal ones that are cold and uncomfortable that are the good ones. Yeah, <laughs> good ones for listening to babies. But we, you know, that's. I don't think many of us know the history of the pinard Mm-mm. and who invented it. I didn't know that. That's a bit scary. And all of the stuff that's sort of around in those late eighteen hundreds is a bit can often be a bit creepy. Mm. Hmm. but it still wouldn't have been used routinely through labor so that was being used in the medical model like if women have been transferred into the hands of the doctors so to speak or would have that yeah midwives would would come down and be used by the community midwives yeah so pinards were used by midwives and obstetricians Mm -hmm. but they would have been used in complicated labors to go oh let's just check if this baby's alive or not alive and then as as birth moved to hospital and we developed more and more technologies, we started just listening to all babies through all labours. Yeah. In and guess who invented it. the Doppler? Mr. Doppler? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Christian uh, Doppler. Christian Doppler. And where Christian is Christian Doppler from? Christian invented the Doppler. Hmm? Where is Christian Where's from? Where he come from? I don't know. I don't think he had it. He wasn't any dodgy eugenics guy, as far as I know. That's what we primarily use now. Although, I mean, we were trained to use a pinard. Yeah. I think that's kind of getting dropped now. But really, but mid, yes. So when I when I was teaching midwifery in the university, would teach about the pinard. Most of the students wouldn't use them in the clinical area because they wouldn't even see them being used in the clinical area. Yeah, I suppose. Gosh, if you're in the hospital mostly it's 
it felt like it was really a community thing. And as soon as you, for, even for me, like back in the early 2000s, once I was working, once I stepped into the hospital, we would use a Doppler. I don't know if yeah, I was still we using did, a but I can't remember. We Can you remember we used to have to, we weren't allowed to put CTG monitor on before we'd have to listen with the pinard mm. and then you'd have to write on the CTG trace, fetal heart rate heard 140 beats per minute with pinard. Yes. Remember? Because then you're isolating that it's the baby and not the mum <clears throat> and you're checking. Yes. And before it was a cesarean section of any kind, yes. even elective, somebody had to go because they used to make us do it as junior midwives just yes. to like stress us out because everyone in theatre is waiting <laughs> to do the surgery and we have to go in with a trumpet and like try and hear a baby's heartbeat and go, yes, you can go ahead. It was like so stressful. Oh and that God, again is because of Doppler, because the pin oddly actually hears the clack, 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 clack like of the baby's heart sounds yeah whereas the doppler sends out ultrasound waves and kind of makes the movement that it picks up into a sound so yeah. you're ma- you're hearing the sound that the device is creating which can be like you said like can be maternal sounds yep so you could you know if, if a woman's got a high heart rate mm-hmm. for any reason you're listening to a blood vessel and you're going to go oh that's the baby's heart rate and it's not and it's quite wet. likely she's gonna have a heart rate if you're going for an emergency cesarean section and a exactly. it could be 110 120 and you're yeah. going oh it's sitting 120 off we go yeah. great and we were supposed to use them in community yes because we were taught as students we weren't allowed to put on the doppler until you heard this the yes. heart rate with the pinard so you remember that to use it but it's really handy because Dopplers don't always work. So when I was a private practice midwife, I never actually had my own proper Doppler. This is so, such a skin flint. Um, <laughs> it's like crappy plastic one <laughs> oh, yeah. that I'd use if I was doing antenatally because it just didn't really matter. And I'd have a pin odd. But if a, if a woman wanted a Doppler for birth, I would borrow one off a friend because they, ex- they were bloody expensive, those yeah. professional Dopplers. I'd borrow one off a friend for the birth. And I've been at a booth where the Doppler didn't work. Really? Because you always think yeah, it's like an you... urban myth because everyone goes, what happens nah. if it didn't work? And everyone's like, well, you'd have a million batteries and they always work. <laughs> <laughs> no, didn't work. And um, by the time the other midwife had gone out to the car to get the Doppler, and the woman was in water. She'd started pushing her baby out anyway. So I was like, oh, probably don't didn't need it. Do. We can assess the ba- baby yeah. when the baby's here. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah. so that's the Doppler and the pinard. So I would like to bring back the pinard. Oh, I'll tell you another. I've got a, my favourite pinard. I, no, I won't get up and go and show you because the sound will go funny. <laughs> no, I will. Hold on. All right, show me. Right now, then I've got to take screenshot. You'll just have to. Um, no, I'll, set, I'll send you a picture. It's better if it's with I'll you. send you a photograph of it. Right, look. So this is oh. this. I was looking after Oh, you've got right, one so it's those. like a stethoscope thing yes. with a trumpety thing, right? The story behind this is I was looking after a woman who didn't want Doppler, uh, me to use a Doppler at all, right? And I've had women who didn't want me to look at, listen with a Doppler during pregnancy, but most women you care for, when you're talking about, and we'll talk about this options for listening to the baby, they say, I'll just use a Doppler when I'm in labor because it's basically easier to get in without distracting yeah. the woman with a Doppler than a pinard, like ramming your head next to her belly. Yeah. So anyway, this woman didn't want the Doppler, which is like, okay, fine, got pinards. And she but she wanted a water birth. And I said, well, bear in mind I can't listen to the <laughs> baby underwater with a pinard because I haven't got a snorkel <laughs> mask. <laughs> Why didn't you get one? That would have been ace. <laughs> I'm not sure that the pinards work underwater. I don't think they do. So she said, oh, well, the baby that she had in America, in America, the midwife had a one of these things, you know, and she said, no, and said did it work underwater? And she was like, yeah, 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 it worked underwater. I was like, really? Wow. I went, all right, then I'll buy one. So I tracked one down, spent a bloody fortune on getting it um, all the way from, shipped all the way from America. And then when she was in labor, couldn't hear the bloody heart rate with it, could I? <laughs> you couldn't. <laughs> No, <laughs> didn't work under one. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I can't actually hear the baby. So do you want me to not listen to the baby or do you want me to use the Doppler? What do you want me to do? And she went, oh, just use the Doppler. Went, oh, well, okay. You spent all but that time nice... researching it. 
and getting it shipped in preparation. But now you have a great tool to show. I have a Go fantastic tell. Doppler now that I never use these days. But yeah, so that's the Doppler in the Pinard. So we know that the Pinard does not work underwater. It was also invented by a man. And then what did I say? Doppler or Pinard? Pinard. And the Doppler yeah. is, just in case anyone's lost, is the electronic device that works by ultrasound picking up the waves of the baby's heartbeat and then and does was, work underwater and does work underwater yes yeah yes. i don't think they always would have now they're waterproof no you have to have a waterproof one i've yeah. made that mistake before <laughs> otherwise you're also gonna spend money on a complete waste of thing that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, broken okay moving on um was the ctg invented by mr ctg <laughs> 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 probably <laughs> didn't come with a name I don't know. It? actually i don't know who invented the ctg can i see if imagine if it was actually that was his uh i'm assuming his It'd be nice if it was woman um that was his initials and then he was like i'll fit it around but then he would be mr cardio tocograph <laughs> <laughs> maybe if there's anyone out there who knows a cardio tokograph as their surname please let us know <laughs> okay good um so that's the usual practice and so when you let me just go back because you were talking about the university and what we were doing but it's not currently the practice to teach student midwives to use the pinard Oh, it probably is, but then they don't do it. And as you know, you don't, with a pinard, it's like blood pressures. Like you can't hear a thing for ages. Like it's a real, yeah. you have to keep doing it and keep doing it. And all yeah. of a sudden you go, oh, oh my God, yeah. I know what I'm listening for now. So it has to be something when you're learning that you're doing a lot to get it. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know whether that's happening in practice. And I think then comes the fear of frightening women that you're not hearing it. But then comes the language that you use to say I'm learning this takes time mm. this is blah 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 blah, and the reassurance and that becomes the norm of you doing that and then probably using the Doppler for her to hear yeah yeah if she wants to so you're going to ask me about the evidence for it aren't you like yeah getting to my notes it's quite small <laughs> <laughs> would you like me to ask you about the evidence about this actually Rachel <laughs> Because well, I think what? there's definitely something to say about this, isn't there, really? Well, there's actually not, because there isn't any evidence. Well, yeah. <laughs> Moving on. That's it. There's always saying, finished. So this was introduced without any evidence to try and pick up which babies were getting distressed during labour by listening to their heart rate. But then nobody looked at whether or not it did improve outcomes. And then nobody will because nobody's going to now randomly allocate women to not having any auscultation of their baby's heart rate or so nobody listening to their baby to compare them to a group of women who have had that because it would be unethical. Yeah, of course. It's so in, entrenched now. You can't, it's, so it's a bit like research, you know, a lot of the research now can't be done to support the things we're doing because it's not ethical to allocate not offer it and to not have things yes so it's not going to be done and if you look at the guidelines on intermittent auscultation so intermittent auscultation is kind of the term that's used for listening to the baby intermittently regularly during labor which is kind of what all low-risk women, in quotes, are meant to have. That's what's recommended in guidelines. So if you look at those recommendations and it'll say, you know, here's the pattern of how often you're meant to listen in and they'll have a reference. And if you go to the, I've done this, because, mm. you know, as Sarah Wickham said, this is one of my very sad hobbies. Um, you go and find the reference for that and it'll reference another guideline. Then you go to the guideline, it references another guideline. And occasionally you come to a bit of research and this is a pretty old bit of research that they're, so they're using this bit of research to argue or to, to support the recommendation that we should be listening to the baby's heart rate 
every, it keeps changing, but 30 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is. But that research didn't look at that. So this was a bit of research. I should have the dates, but it was ages ago. Was it the 80s? The link will be in my blog because I don't retain most important information in my head. Um, but what it did was it compared a religious group or community who didn't have any antenatal care in the medical system. They would have probably had midwives and didn't have um, fetal heart rate monitoring in labor. So they yeah. compared the outcomes for that group with the outcomes in a kind of modern American kind of mainstream hospital setting. Uh -huh. And there was higher rates of perinatal mortality in the religious group. Mm -hmm. So that's what they looked at. So then from that, they're saying that the reason that the mortality, perinatal mortality wasn't as good was because these women didn't have obstetric medical oversight during their labours. The labor. But did they look but at that, any other can't confounding that that. factors? No, or... no. So there was more preterm babies, more growth restricted babies in that group. And it could have been any one of a, a you know million variables that was the cause. But they put it down to that we could have stopped this because of there was no monitoring going on. And do we know that those midwives in the community, in the religious community, were not using a pinard or? No, they, they didn't have modern, modern in quotes, you know, obstetric care. So we've just kind of created, so we've done that research, which wasn't a great bit of research anyway, but then that's been used to support doing intermittent auscultation wow. when it was didn't set out to do that. It didn't set out to find that out. But that seems to be the, I'm sure the listeners will send me any other references because I haven't, that's the one bit of research that I've managed to track down linking to the guidelines. Really? So nothing we else. haven't got There's evidence. Nothing that, else done? No, no. There's no there's no research looking at timing of listening to the heart yes. rate, whether or not it should be 30 minutes, whether or not it should be an hour, whether it should increase during the pushing phase, which it yeah. says now in all the guidelines that, you know, there none of that. That was just implemented because, you know, more is better. I remember that coming in. And then it was, I think, when I was still in birth, so it was 50, every 15 minutes. It was five minutes during pushing, I think. Oh, no, after every contraction. Yeah. How can we have no evidence to change anything? So what are well like, because what are we nice don't need evidence getting together and discussing? If you're changing things in the direction that people want it to go, you don't need the evidence. But if you're wanting to change it in a different direction, like continuity of care, water birth, then you've got to provide all the evidence that those things are safe in order to get anybody to even consider them. Oh my God. And there's no consideration of the risks. Yes you know of increasing this surveillance and how that might disrupt physiology if we're constantly digging about trying to find a baby's heart rate when a woman's pushing a baby out exactly. which is really difficult when it's very low down so what you end up seeing is clinicians putting ctg monitors on yeah. which we'll come to because it's just you know constantly digging in and yeah. constantly asking the woman to move to get in to listen to the baby when what we do know is that there are normal abnormalities in the baby's heart rate during pushing so as the vagal nerve gets compressed in the neck you're going to see the heart rate decelerate so that's perfectly normal babies are meant to get stressed during labor to a certain degree because that actually initiates epigenetic changes it helps them transition to breathing so labor is meant to be a bit stressful yeah. and most healthy term babies can manage it so we're trying to identify the ones that can't. But what we know is if the baby's heart rate has been normal during labor, even if it is abnormal when the woman's pushing the baby out, there is not an increased risk of adverse outcomes. So why do we panic? Well, why are we doing it so often? Exactly. Where did that number come from? <gasps> All right. Okay. I should have warned you in advance. This is probably going to be clear as mud and... Really confuzzling. No. Ah, <laughs> oh. oh, this is so annoying because this is the classic of like things then start to get into the nitty gritty of birth um, and labor. And that's when we see changes or we hear changes. And then it seems like 
okay, we need to put a CTG monitor on, or we even need to put a clip on the baby's head and we get really invasive in what we're doing. And then the disruption to the that kind of the world that that woman's in. Um, oh, my God. The instinctive birth behaviours, the oxytocin release, Absolutely. what happens after birth in terms of is, is, is she, has she, have you distracted her out of releasing all of her oxytocin yeah. that she needs to then get a placenta out? So, yeah, I think it would be really helpful if we didn't just assume that intermittent auscultation, even though it's like it's the core part of midwifery in, in labour and birth, you know, women, mm-hmm. I have not had a woman invite me to her birth who doesn't want any form of me listening to the baby because that's why women hire midwives but we need to consider what we're doing as an intervention and how can we do it in a way that least disrupts physiology and is effective so we're going to listen in and let's listen in but effectively but let's not disrupt let's work around the woman you know and then there are ways of doing that but that then means not being flowcharty about it and not being prescriptive about timings means fitting around the woman and her baby and what she wants and what's happening at that moment but it's not really how the systems work is it that's fine in in home birth but it isn't it's really it's you know how do you stand up when you've got it in your guideline within the hospital that you're working in and it says you have to do every 15 minutes or you have to do every 30 minutes and then it's i mean it's obviously it's a discussion with the woman and um but then it's so much extra paperwork because you have to write um you know as previously discussed i don't know when so and so was in this position um we knew that this would not be an opportune time i can't even think of words to um listen to the baby therefore we are waiting another 5 minutes see if position change or whatever it's well, like no it's so not easy is it you don't have to no it's not easy and you, but you don't. So guidelines around what you're meant to be doing to women in labour in hospitals are guidelines, oh, nice. and they're about offering interventions to women. So it's about how you share that information with the woman. Hope, and this is why continuity of care works so much better because you can have these conversations yeah. before women go into labour. So you can talk about the evidence and say, look, a lot of midwives and women find it very reassuring to listen to the baby's heart rate. You've also got to bear in mind the risk of, and there is some research around this, it causing anxiety mm. when you don't hear it or when it sounds fast to you or when it sounds low to you that that there can be some anxiety generated from listening to the heart rate. So you need to also be aware of that, particularly if it's a Doppler and you're hearing the sound. Um, but you need to have these conversations with women if you are in a position to do that. If you're not, then even in a not continuity of care, then it's about saying to the woman in this hospital, we listen to the baby this amount of times. That's what our guidelines say. However, it can be quite disruptive. So what, and I don't want to disrupt your birth because you're doing amazingly, blah, blah, blah. So what I used to say to women in a hospital setting or anywhere is I'll come at you, (laughs) come at you with the Doppler. (laughs) I'll just, I'll not say anything. I'll just move towards you and if it's not something you want me to do at that time for whatever reason just gently push the doppler or the pinard away i won't be offended i'd really rather you did that than let me disrupt what's happening Mm. and then you just document declined feel heart rate and then next time you try it so i've had quite a good friend of mine who may or may not be listening to this pretty much her entire notes were declined feel heart rate declined feel heart (laughs) declined feel heart rate because she didn't want it at the times when I was trying to do it. So there are ways of, of working around that. That's really good. And centering the woman, not just that I need to do this thing because that's what the guidelines say. Yeah. Most women will not push you away because they're, they're taught to be nice and kind and mm-hmm. comply, which is that's not your problem as a, as a midwife. You can't control a woman's conditioning before she comes in or what she wants or doesn't want. Of All you can do is be with woman and fit around that woman. Yep. Oh, that's brilliant. Like to have some kind of tips on how to navigate that. So what happens when we bring in the big guns and we bring in the CTG? Well, the CTG is recommended for all women who are, and again, in quotes, high risk. So women end up getting categorized as low risk, intermittent auscultation, 
which pretty much no women managed to be low risk <laughs> all the way <laughs> so through. It feels like. Like they should get a certificate at the end if you manage to get all the way through and you're still That's low not risk. fair, Rachel. <laughs> I think the midwife should get the certificate, actually. <laughs> but like, yeah, for not noticing all of the terrible things that are happening, like, you know, meconium with a post-dates baby, which is perfectly normal. So there's all these things that can happen during labor that mean that you gonna... ramble. No, I'm not going to talk about meconium. <clears throat> Or things like epidurals and things that are a genuine, um, they're a shift from physiological birth into medical Absolutely. birth where we're doing an intervention. So we need to like make sure what we're doing is safe for the mother and the baby or induction. So that's when a CTG is recommended is when either we're doing an intervention that puts the mother and baby at risk or the mother and baby are already at risk. So, you know, preterm yeah. or there's something. There are kind of two main causes of field distress. One is the baby. So a small baby who hasn't got the reserves on board. And I talk about, you know, hasn't got the Kendall mint cake for the journey. What? Do you know what Kendall, Kendall mint cake is? Yeah, no, but it's from like up north. And it's like a big lump of sugar mint. Yeah. But no one else is going to know what Kendall mint cake is. <laughs> Where are you from? We should get sponsored by them. Kendall mint cake. I'm going to reach out to them. Go on. So are you right, talking so about that it's so a big sugary... Yeah, so babies, labor is stressful, right? Healthy full-term babies have got like onboard glycogen stores, basically sugar that they can use to help them get through labor. Mm -hmm. Little scrawny babies, whether they're preterm or growth restricted, don't have that. So babies can be a problem. The placenta can also be a problem. So either not having enough rest between contractions, for example, with inductions, where the placentas, and we've talked about get placentas getting squashed like a sponge. Yeah. If that's happening, if there's a problem with a placenta, like preeclampsia, placentas are not normal. They're not good, great at oxygenating anyway. And then you add in labor and they're a bit stuffed. Growth restricted babies' placentas are not great. Medications, all of these things can change the placenta and or the baby and can increase the chance of distress. So that's when CTG monitors are meant to be being used. That's when. However, ask me about the evidence. Rachel, <laughs> what's the evidence for how for we're Mr. currently CTG. using CTGs from Mr. CTG? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is really, really muddy because there is research. Yeah. Come on, yeah. give it to me. But give it, it doesn't me. support, it doesn't say, it. the research doesn't demonstrate that CTG monitoring improve the outcomes for babies mm. and it does show that it increases instrumental birth and surgery for women yes that's the general research but what's interesting what blows my mind because as a midwife like because we're brought up on it aren't we like you feel safe yeah with a ctg monitor on yeah, right totally. and i want to i want to read you a quote from my book so this is a quote about ctgs it can be argued that strapping a woman to a ctg machine is the modern equivalent of wrapping her belly in amulets and prayer rolls because that's what we used to do in the past so we used to in the past women would have their bellies wrapped with amulets and prayer rolls to protect the baby so we do that now in our modern right of wow. protection and we feel safe yeah. And the woman possibly feels safe as well. Yeah, because... We think that we're mitigating danger when all of the research tells us we're not. Now, that, I find that really hard because I actually like it. Here's a confession of a midwife. I actually liked interpreting CTGs because they appeal to my um, looking at patterns and quantifying it and like assessing it and like, oh, look, and, and all those little mantras that you have. I used to teach CTG interpretation. So, you know, you the earlies are the head compression and the lates are the placenta and, the, you know, lates have mates and all of this bullshit that we say and teach and learn, wow. which has no evidence to support it. And actually putting a CTG machine on a woman doesn't, it now it does, if you look at the population, so the CTG, the Cochrane Review kind of pulled all of the research together. And I like to start with Cochrane Reviews because they're supposed to be the gold standard. So mm -hmm. they've done the hard work for you. But this is research that spanned the 1970s onwards. 
And the categorizations of low risk and high risk were kind of all over the place. So in some studies, women being augmented were low risk. And so it was a bit messy. But if you kind of look at that, it shows that there's no difference for the baby apart from there's a reduction in neonatal seizures, but not a reduction in cerebral palsy or perinatal death or all those things that you think are associated with reduced oxygen. And the reduction in neonatal seizures, we're talking about look, measuring it in the 10,000s. Yeah. And I've got the stats on my blog post because I can't keep them in my head. But that was, wasn't was significant for high-risk women. It was for low-risk women. What? Hold on. That's like blowing my mind. So what? Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so if this is for low-risk women, then what are we seeing for women with a high-risk pregnancy or a, a birth? Well, it doesn't improve outcomes, but then again, you've got to be careful because they mix in all the risks. So they mix in, you know, babies who have just passed meconium with preterm babies with, you know, because the risk categories are so diverse. Yeah. That there isn't a way to nut out whether this particular risk would have a better outcome statistically with yeah. the CTG or not. So we basically don't have, we have got the research, but it's a bit muddy and doesn't really tell us much apart from the fact that CTGs don't improve, they certainly don't improve outcomes for women. They significantly increase cesarean sections and instrumental birth. Yeah. And there's not good evidence that they improve the outcomes long term for babies. I'm, I'm just, I know this, <laughs> but then when we talk about it, it just feels like, what are we doing? Why are we doing well, this? Well, that's why, why is that's it why just I litigation? Read you the quotes. That's why I read yeah, it because it makes me uncomfortable because I like to have a CTG monitor on a baby that I'm worried about because it makes me feel safe. So, Absolutely. I understand that as well. I've been in those situations, but it's because it's ingrained in us that it is yes. safe and you don't. But then you also know as a midwife, OK, I'm now strapping this woman to a ctg and there are mobile ctgs now and mm -hmm. not all of them are with you know a wire that's a meter long so restricting her movements mm -hmm. however as waterproof ones as well oh wow fantastic yeah so, so women can go in the pool or in the shower so i'm going to sound mm. really stupid oh. here because it's been a while since i've been in but i think that's why it's good when i ask these questions um so my understanding was always that we increased the sort of rate of instrumental birth, needing an epidural, and then the cascade of intervention, because we sort of reduced the movements of the woman um, by strapping her to this thing. But now I'm thinking also, especially when I think back to what Ellie was talking about, about it's it's that kind of thing of when we bring in the big guns or this is the start of the big guns this is the start of something being medicalized in a birth that maybe has been progressing a, pro a labor that's been progressing without any medical intervention then what does this do to the psyche and what does this do to our mm. internal awareness awareness of oh this has happened this is the next step does that put that seed of doubt in and is it that kind of cascade that's going on of the seed of doubt's in, I'm not then coping as well with pain, I need an epidural, and then we get onto this kind of bandwagon of we've added all these things in, then movement is not great. She's not in herself, and we're leading on to a more instrumental or cesarean birth. I think that's true, but I think a large portion of it, of the unnecessary surgeries, is how we interpret CTGs. Okay. Because we actually don't know. Most babies who look like they are distressed on a trace are fine. And, you know, anyone who has worked, it, been in cesarean sections will tell you that. But babies come out screaming after they've yeah. been like in fetal distress. They're absolutely fine. Yeah. So there's all of these false positives because we don't still understand how to interpret the machines because we've got all these little sayings and all these things that we think, but there isn't any research to back them up. And what we're seeing is decisions being made when you're looking at a heart rate of a baby and the heart rate of a baby 
is showing you the baby compensating and babies are bloody good at compensating mm -hmm. for things that are happening to them during labor, healthy full-term babies. Yeah. So we're seeing them actually doing a physiological response to something like increasing the heart rate to get more oxygen around their body or decreasing the heart rate when something gets, you know, their cord gets squished and it releases and it pops back up again. So you're seeing these, but they're interpreted as fetal distress, which they may become for some babies, but for most babies, they don't. So then we're doing surgery. When I went to, I went to Nauru um, years back now and it was interesting. It was one of those, oh, you know, they've had some poor outcomes. You can go in, you know, as white Western women and sort it out. And it's like, well, actually, we probably caused the problems in the mm -hmm. first place <laughs> by importing, you know, medicalization mm -hmm. over there. Um, they had been given a CTG machine. So these lovely midwives who are actually doing an amazing job, particularly with preterm babies and things, were wanting to learn how to interpret the CTG. Because what was happening was more and more women were having cesarean sections with high rates of di like actual diabetes and not gestational diabetes in the population and wound healing. and all. It was actually causing problems. Yeah. So they wanted to learn how to interpret. And I was so conflicted. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I actually did think the interpretation was correct. I was teaching it and I actually really did believe that, you know, all the squiggly lines and what we're taught about them is correct. Yeah. But I was really like should should I be teaching this anyway they want me to so we, I did with a provisor of like this may not be helpful wow, but this is the machine and this situation. is how to use it yeah they'd also been giving an um, incubator oh it's so funny I was looking through Jenny pictures was... yesterday and I'd been at the women deliver conference in Canada back in 2019 and I found a picture that I had taken of a I think they had this sort of photography thing um, and I'd taken a picture of the photo and it was basically like a incubator graveyard in terms of there was maybe 50 incubators that had all been dumped from a country that wasn't a sort of developed country because they had gone they'd broken down no one was there to service mm -hmm. them and they couldn't use them mm -hmm. for the the high-risk neonates um and I looked at that last night so so they get well that's exactly what happened they had one incubator and it had broken yeah and they were wanting to know how to get and they were keeping preterm babies alive with kangaroo mother care oh you know, no the, the actual gold what? standard yeah what? they were doing it but of course they were <laughs> because the research but supports this technology that. must be better than that isn't it just it's amazing can but i just not go back and ask you I was going to say, it's not surprising in a really technocratic world where we're brought up believing that technology and medicine save everything, and, you know, me included, that we mm. trust the machines, that we want to have them as our kind of amulets, our prayer rolls. I love that. And that's how they're I mean, I hate that, but I love that you say that it's like an amulet. It is. Yeah, I want to I wanna actually just go back and ask you a question about the increase in cesarean rates or has there been any research? Because obviously now we will do a blood gas afterwards to check mm. the infant. Has there been any research that's compared the blood gases with the CTGs and gone, okay, these blood gases were poor, the CTG absolutely represented that? Or um, as there are a lot of, anyway, that's my question. You can answer yes, that. Yes, there has been research that has looked at CTGs plus all the various other assessments that happen, because there's a few now, there's fetal pulse oximetry or something i've never used that i have no idea what it is mm -hmm. um lactates you know checking the whether a baby's you know the ph and all that business mm -hmm. so there's research that's looked at that versus just intermittent auscultation and what it found was there was no improvement for babies there was just more surgery for women and they actually concluded that intermittent auscultation reduces surgery um and the women. outcomes so that, are no worse and, for babies no and no and there's no there's research looking at you know whether or not lactate then would alter all it does is increase surgery but doesn't decrease it doesn't improve the outcomes because of course we're then doing oh my god that baby's oh no sorry what it does is it does the opposite it pushes out people then don't do a cesarean based on the ctg trace they put it off and put it off and put it off 
but the outcomes are no different. Okay, so it's a real minefield then. It is. And for premature babies, yep. it actually increases their chance of cerebral palsy if you put a CTG monitor on during labor. What? So it's just all over the place. Yeah, exactly. It's all over the place, really muddy. But in a nutshell, CTG <sighs> monitors... <laughs> Yeah, but I can't imagine not having a CTG monitor on with a preterm. I know, baby. I know, and I'm not saying don't put one on. Don't. No, do I know your, you're definitely not. They're so entrenched now that this is just part of what we do, and we need we need to be challenging it with research and and shifting at a higher level. You know, as a midwife, I would not be um, game enough to just kind of say to a woman, let's not bother putting a CTG monitor on because. <laughs> not going to improve your outcomes. I think it needs to be the woman who makes that decision. And most oh, women, exactly, are not I going, mean, who's, not I mean, gonna... who's going to have read all of that research? And then if we're, if, what boggles me is that research like this is done with such kind of like um, clumsy kind of outcomes, clumsy is the wrong word, like just unclear <laughs> outcomes. And then we don't, go okay we need to have a bigger grant and do a uh some more research or we need to look at this differently and we need to keep keep researching in this field to find out the best possible way of doing something we just seem to stop and it's go, already oh part, it's, well no but it's already part of our birth culture and it's not about evidence it's about it's about the birth culture and it reflects perfectly that women's bodies and or dangerous for their babies and the external experts and their technology are safe. That's basically the underlying message of our modern maternity systems because of what they came out of. They're just reflecting that. So I don't think you're going to get any big change anytime soon. It would need to be the birth culture that shifts first because research is then just done in the same kind of paradigms. It's, it's done asking questions that are aligned with the paradigm it's in yeah do you know what I mean the current situation and we can't go away from that like we said yeah. because ethically you couldn't you couldn't do a study where you opt in or opt out it wouldn't be allowed no wow well there's and most women even if you say to them look there's not evidence that supports that this will improve the outcome for your baby in fact it might increase your chance of surgery without doing that what would you like to do? Most women will say, I'll have the monitor on because it gives them a sense of safety that their baby's been watched, that it's... Absolutely. It doesn't make sense in our head that you would watch the baby and it would cause a poorer outcome. It just is mm. so difficult to comprehend that as a midwife. And I imagine as someone who's going in labour. Also, if things start to change and then someone comes in and says, I think we should start continuously monitoring, the fear that's there to st to say do you know what I remember I was told about this research it ain't the time you're not going to be thinking that way like <laughs> in that environment it's it's really no. challenging and it's really challenging to work in I feel like this podcast mm -hmm. just we constantly just say it's really challenging with everything well because it is it's I know truth. first step is seeing it okay Good. That's why we're talking about this. And acknowledging then. it. And I think sometimes for a lot of people working in the system, just having it validated that, yeah, it, it is hard and it doesn't actually make sense. Yeah. And you don't need to try and make it make sense because it doesn't. Is actually quite validating that they don't feel completely bonkers because you can start to think, yeah. am I completely, am I the weird one here? Yeah. Well, I usually am. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> they like, think. But that's totally true. That's how I feel. I feel like, oh, God, what do you do? But, I, yeah, that's right. It's almost like there's a collective knowledge. What you do is what you can do, and that goes back to our podcast with the spheres of influence. What did I call it then? What did you think I'd edited that? Spheres of influence. The fears of influence. <laughs> yeah, you remember. You misheard it and then decided that's what I'd said when I didn't, miss, I didn't say that. Right, whatever. I said sphere spheres of influence yeah but you went off talking about kendall mint cake i'm going to ask them for sponsorship <laughs> <laughs> i found a picture of kendall mint cake for my uh, lesson 
Well, I would imagine with Googles, you can um, find pictures of most things. Yeah, but most things aren't copyright free. So when you when you're doing it like online course stuff or online membership stuff you have to find copyright free things seriously I think I spend most of my life trying oh. to find copyright free yeah. images but there was one of Kendall Mincake no way you know you could have written to them and they probably would have said yes oh well, I'm not sure it's great advertising is it <laughs> <laughs> a lump of sugar and some bed mint oil in it probably not the best we're not advising that listeners right well that look I think that's is that your roundup for today? Well, have you finished with your questions? Yes, I have. Just confuse everyone and leave them confused. Well, Rachel, I think you have given us a lovely roundup of um, fetal monitoring during labour. So, roundup? That's yes, like roundup. Sheep dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing my whistle. You can't hear it unless you're a dog. Yep, Shep. Shep. Oh, wait. Come by. Come by. Come by. Come by. Come by. <laughs> How many sheep you got today, love? Brilliant. Uh, right. Can I go? You, you are dismissed. Thank you very much. Thank Until you. next time. <laughs> Whilst I've still got you, because I know you're waiting for the bloopers. What? Wait. You've never listened to the end before and heard all the bloopers. Oh, you've got some backtracking to do. Anyway, I hope you found a good few golden nuggety nuggetness of nuggets in there. So, you know the drill. Please go and shout loud about this by sharing it on your socials, telling Apple Podcasts what you think, and also please do consider supporting the show. For the price of a cup of coffee each month, it makes a huge difference to the content we can keep bringing to you. Also, pop on over to my just released website and sign up for all my new stuff coming tray soon. And let's not forget the doctor in the house either. Go and say hello to Rachel too. She's got fantastic courses, books and an incredible collective you should check out. So all I've got to say now is I really hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next time. And of course, here's the bloopers. <sighs> it's the clock's gone back. That's why we're going to record two. So I will wake up. So I'm really glad you're doing. What are you talking about? Listening to the baby during the labour. Why this topic? <laughs> What's <stop>. the history? <laughs> what are you bloody talking about? <laughs> oh, well, you sent me an email last night with it. So, you know. Actually, today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was sleeping. So I haven't had a chance. And as the clocks have gone back, it's um, I got up at 6.45. Made myself a cup of tea and had a shower to wake myself up. Um, okay. But, but did you get... I sent another... I sent two because I added a question to it. So have you got the second email? Don't huff at me. I added a question. Winky face. Right. <laughs> Which one? Right, that's the one. Wait, hold on. Let me look yes. at the time. Oh, you sent it at 7.15. So 30 minutes ago. <laughs> oh, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> so is this the full list now? That one? Or do I have yeah. to go between emails? Oh, this is nope, going to be seamless. Fullest. Seamless today. <laughs> right. Oh, you didn't add the, the title, though, in that one. So now I've got to go back and remember what the title is. Hold on. What do, what's the usual yeah, I don't know. I haven't got a title. Something to do with... What causes... Yeah, but I've got to know what we're doing. What are we listening to babies for? And, uh, what's the evidence in intermittent auscultation? What causes fetal distress? Oh, that listening to babies. Oh, during labour. <laughs> really tired <laughs> it's really early <laughs> oh jeez well hopefully you'll wake up by the time I've finished mine and be ready to go for yours <laughs>